talking uh, on, about the love of God for a few weeks now. How many of you know that's an endless message? Praise God. <laughs> the Bible says that we may comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. Amen. You can never explore the fullness of it. The moment you grasp something, he's already gone beyond that. Amen. One of the things we shared last week was out of Psalm 91, if we want to turn to Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2, and just read together. Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. Or you can, you guys are Bible scholars, I'm sure you'll be able to just say it from, from the heart. It says, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress and my God, in him I will trust. And we're talking about these things are personal. Yes, God loves us all, but his love is personal. Amen. Let's read verse 2 together. Let's, let's declare together. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Amen. It's a personal declaration. It says, I will say of the Lord. Doesn't matter what everybody else is saying. Yeah, we all say corporately, but I will say of the Lord that He is my refuge, He is my fortress, He is my God. In Him, I will trust. It's 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 personal. Amen. And every one of us have access to this intimacy and personal fellowship and communion with the Lord. And we need to build on that. We need to grow that. Amen. So it goes beyond what we do corporately. Into It means when you leave this place, you just take it privately and continue to do the same thing. Amen. Uh, but as much as it's important for us to make that declaration. It's another thing to see how God sees us personally as well, because God also sees us personally. Amen. Uh, I'm not a great singer, but there were hymns that have been written about, he knows my name, right? There's a song like that, right? He knows my name. Amen. And I want us to explore some of that thought this morning. Turn your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16. If my voice sounds funny, just pray for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. My wife and I have been through, uh, how do I describe it? A lot these past two weeks. Uh, our air conditioning packed up like two Sundays ago. And it was out until Friday evening. Uh, so all that time in all this heat and humidity, we were <laughs> sweating in the house. Where she had, I walk from home, she goes out to an air-conditioned office, so she, she, gets, she gets a few hours respite, <laughs> and I'm stuck there. Uh, so it kind of uh, got, on, got on me after a while, but uh, by his stripes, I'm healed in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 16, let's begin to read from verse 1. It says, Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abraham, See now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. And Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, so he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. 
Then Sarai said to Abraham, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between you and me. So Abraham said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Verse 7. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness. An angel of the Lord. I don't know if you're reading from the New King James, you find that the word angel is capi- is, it has a capital A there. An angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to shore. And he said, Hagar, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand, then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael. Because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Verse 13. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. For she said... Have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore the well was called Beer Lahai Roy. Observe it, it is between Kadesh and Beret. The word here translated in English is the word Adonai El Roy. It's not uh, the name it's not a name of God we speak about very much, but it's an important manifestation of God, Adonai el Roi, the Lord, the God who sees me, the God who sees me, hallelujah, amen, that's the character of God, all these names are all covenant names of God, they are manifestations of his person, of his character, he's the God who sees me. He doesn't just see everybody. He sees me. Hallelujah. You guys are too quiet. I don't know. I'm I'm excited already. (laughs) He doesn't just see everybody. He sees me. He sees me. He sees you. He sees you. If you look at the context of this story, she had made a mistake. What she did was wrong. I don't know, I guess you ladies understand this a little bit better than us. Uh, She got pregnant. Abraham had been married to Sarai for about 11 years and nothing had happened. She probably got pregnant in weeks. I was like, hey, look at me, (laughs) you know. And she was really, you know, feeling cool with herself that, you know, what my mistress couldn't do for 11 years, here am I in weeks, I already did it, and she had a chip on her shoulder. Uh, So it was a mistake on her part to do that. That wasn't the correct thing for her to do. And because of that, uh, Sarai was upset with Abraham, with Abraham at the time. His name was still Abraham. God had not changed his name to Abraham and rebuked Abraham for what was going on. Uh, I don't quite know if this is Abraham's fault. You people can tell me later, right? <laughs> uh, but Sarah rebuked Abraham for, for this. Abraham said, hey, 
it's your mate, you do whatever you want to do, you know, you brought her, if you want to send her away, do that. And she started to treat her very harshly. And um, because of that experience, she ran off and went into the wilderness. And it was at the wilderness that the Lord visited her. It says in verse 9, it says, Then the angel of the Lord said, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord made some promises. And at the end of it, what she saw, the rev- and this is a, this, when, whenever people begin to call God a certain name, then you know that a revelation has happened. Their eyes have been supernaturally opened to see an aspect of God. And in verse 13, she says, you are the God who sees me. It says you are the God who sees, but if you read on, if you see her, her question that follows, says, have I also here seen him who sees me? So the, the revelation experience she had was, this God sees me, even though in the scheme of things, where I'm just a slave in a household of my mistress and my master, this God sees me. He identifies with me. He knows me. He sees my faults. He sees my weaknesses. But yet, he still knows me and still loves me. And that was the experience she had. And she says, I have seen the one who sees me. And I think this is an aspect of God I believe we as believers need to begin to cultivate. Many times we see ourselves just among the number. And sometimes we see ourselves under very difficult circumstances. Or you see yourself in, uh, you might be in a situation, for instance, maybe the economy is not going well. And you just see yourself as, one of the number, you are one of the statistics for the job market, right? But no, you are not a statistic. There is a God who sees you, who knows you. And we need to begin to develop that understanding and mindset that we are not just one of a number. We are not just part of a group. There is a God who sees us, who knows us personally. And in this particular case, she was under authority, and authority was exercised against her when she ran off. But with her experience with God, she recognized the God who saw her, in spite of how helpless she was under that situation, God saw her and recognized her. And God gave her advice. In fact, if you see the way God referred to her, God referred to her as Sarai's maid. So her position did not change, but now there was a recognition from God of who she was, regardless of her position. And the advice from the Lord was to go back and submit yourself. He gave her counsel on how to function in that environment. How many of you know that when she went back, everything was well? Because she had received counsel from the Lord. And sometimes we go against things. We can go against, you know, for uh, our family went through maybe about 11 years trying to obtain a green card. And after 11 years, you begin to see yourself as just part of the statistic. It's like, what's the number? You know, where is it going to come? You know, okay, this is where it's going. And you can you start reading all the stats every day. You see where's the, what do they call that thing again? The cutoff point or the, the processing dates? Those of you who have been through the green card will un- understand that. There are processing dates they publish. And maybe they are still processing one that is five years before yours. And then you are still in the system. And even that five years that has been processed can be there for six months and hasn't changed. You just see yourself as helpless, but there is a God who sees you. He sees where you are. He recognizes where you are. He knows who you are, and he identifies with you. Amen.
He identifies with you. You may be in a job, maybe somebody who has power over you, decides to do something you consider unfair or unjust. There is a God who sees you. There's a God who sees you. His interest is not to go punish the person who was unjust. He just wants to let you know. They may have done that to you, but I see you, I know you. I can still get you to where I plan for you to be. Amen. Is somebody receiving this this morning? I believe this is an aspect of God we need to really grow and develop for ourselves because we become very general. Our faith is general. We believe general things. We need to begin to function in the understanding of the love of God. Many times when we pray, we pray almost prayers that I consider I call technical. They're almost technical question, uh, prayers. Because we are not factoring the enormity of God's love into that situation. If you understand the love of God, your prayers become really very, very simple. Very, very simple. It's very simple. The way I see the love of God, you know when Jesus said, If you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in your heart, and believe that the things that you say shall come to pass, you shall have whatsoever you say. You know how I see that? That sea is God's love. That mountain is whatever problem I am facing. There is no mountain so high that the depth of the sea cannot swallow up. I have done the research. I took my time to check it. The highest mountain, the highest peak ever, I believe, is Mount Everest. Probably about, I don't know, 25,000, 35,000 feet or, or meters. The deepest part of the sea is at least 10,000 meters higher than that. So no matter what the problem is, don't look at the problem when you pray. Look at the love of God when you pray. Let the love of God be the basis of your faith and your action and your requests. Not the enormity of the problem. If you keep looking at the problem, you won't see the answers. But when you look at his love, his love can answer every question. The Bible says love never what? Love never fails. The love of God will never fail. The love of God will never fail. Amen. The love of God will never fail. And we, the prayer we pray, we talk about the length and the, de- and the width and the depth and the height of the love of God. It covers everything. Amen. He, know, he not only knows you, he knows where you are. He knows the circumstances you are in. He knows your name. He knows your social security number. He knows your address. He knows your bank account number. He knows everything about you. Sometimes we think, you know, how's God going to do it? That's not your place to process. Don't process that. Just, yeah, just, just recognize that he loves you and make a request purely based on that and just turn it over to him. Amen. The Apostle Paul tells us, says, be careful, don't be anxious for anything. But in every situation, by what? By prayer and supplication, with what? With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. So don't allow anxiety settling. Meditate on the love of God. We need to begin to talk like the psalmist, I will say of the Lord. You need to begin to talk like the Apostle John says, the disciple whom Jesus loves. Was he the only one that Jesus loved? No, he wasn't. Why was he the only one that was saying it? Because he had extra revelation. He was the only one that was not martyred of all the disciples. 
that were with Jesus. He was the only one who died a natural death. And it wasn't because they didn't try to kill him. They tried to kill him several times. They just couldn't kill him. They boiled him in a pot of oil. By the time they used the hook to bring him out, he was completely intact. His skin hadn't burned. Usually when they do that, it's the skeletons they bring out because the, the heat melts the skin and all this. It just falls off. It's a skeleton. They brought him out. It was completely whole. They banished him to the Isle of Patmos. And there he wrote the book of Revelation. That gives us an insight into what Jesus is doing today. So a lot of the New Testament is the Gospels talk about Jesus to the cross, the resurrection, and shortly after the resurrection. The book of Revelations gives us insight into what he is doing today, his interaction with the churches today. Amen. But how did he live like this. He understood and invested and immersed himself in the love of God. And I believe that's what God is calling every one of us to. To immerse ourselves in the love of God. If you understand the love of God, you don't have to struggle with faith. You don't have to struggle with faith. Because faith really is trusting in God's love for you. That's what faith is. It's trusting in God's love for you. It's trusting that God sees you. God knows you. God recognizes you. And he deals with you directly. Amen. That's why you can pray and just turn around and have complete peace and never worry about it again. It's not because you are superhuman, but because you understand the love of God. It's, it's, a, it's something personal. Something personal. You know you can have a thousand people pray over something, and one person prays over that thing and just feels, oh, it's done. It's done. I just know within me it's done. So it doesn't matter how many other people will pray over it. As far as he's concerned, he's done. And he never prays about it again. That's where God wants to bring us to. So it becomes a personal dialogue. Because just as we recognize him personally as our God, as the one who loves us, he recognizes us. He knows us. Amen. I mentioned the angel of the Lord that we see there in capital. Whenever you see that, it's not just an ordinary angel that shows up when you see that they, they use the capital because the word that's translated is the word Elohim, the angel of the Lord that showed up with him, with Haggai. So you begin to see that God's plan for Gentiles <laughs> wasn't something that was thought of in the New Testament. It's always been the case. From when he called Abraham, he already showed himself to Hagar. He already revealed himself to Hagar. Okay. We were always on God's mind. The nations were always on God's mind. He had already revealed himself to an Egyptian slave and talked to her and showed her his love. And she received his love and went back and began to fellowship with that. When Jesus was uh, in his ministry, he deliberately walked through Samaria. Sometimes we think it was just a mistake. It wasn't a mistake that he walked through Samaria and met that woman by the well. It was deliberate. It was intentional. He went up there. Because the Samaritans at that time were considered Gentiles. They were Jews before, they were part of the nation of Israel, but they backslid and, you know, they got ostracized. They were cut off from the whole of the nation of Israel, and God started speaking to Judah. And the Samaritan was the other backsliding nation. And Jesus went through there. Remember when he met the Syrophoenician woman, and she wanted the daughter to be healed? He said, well, can I take the bread of the children and give it to, to dogs? But when she said, well, she exercised faith, it's like, okay, I haven't seen this kind of faith before. Yeah, the, the option of access to God's love and mercy and grace was always there. 
even when Jesus was ministering among the Jews. He already he knew within him, but at the time he was preparing the seed that he was going to leave behind. Then once the, the church was commissioned by the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, then Paul was raised up to start ministering to the Gentiles. And Peter, even before then, God had spoken to Peter to go to uh, the Cornelius, right? To minister to Cornelius and bring the gospel to them. And the Bible says, while Peter was yet preaching, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. So Peter was taking too long in his sermon. <laughs> God already had salvation happen and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. That was the eagerness of God to reach out uh, to the Gentile nations. And you can see on the cross, the reason Jesus went to the cross was because he could see us. He wasn't only seeing the Jews. He was seeing every man, every woman. Yes, he saw us globally as a collective, but he also saw us individually. You know, there's, there's a saying that says, if it was just for one person, he would have still gone to the cross. That is true. If you study the love of God, you realize that if it was just for one person, he would have still gone to the cross. If it was just for me, or just for you, he would have still gone to the cross for you. Because he sees you. He sees you. He knows you. He knows your flaws. Don't let that be the game changer. Sometimes we think, well, I know he sees me, but I'm not perfect. So because of that, you know, I'm okay with getting mixed results, you know, here and there. No. He sees you. He knows you. Yet he loves you. Remember that song? He knew me, yet he loves me. He whose glory makes the heavens shine. He knew, he knows us. Of such mercy, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Amen. He knew us on that cross. He saw us. He saw us on that cross. He saw you on that cross 2,000 years ago. He saw you. He saw you. When those whips, the cat of nine tails, were used to beat him and yanked his skin off of him, he saw you. He saw you. He bore it for you. It wasn't himself he was doing it for. He saw you. He saw you. He saw you. He knew you. And made sure everything was done to give you complete and total salvation. Amen. He saw you. Glory to God. He saw you. So God is not moved by your imperfections. God is not moved by your weaknesses. You know, the Bible never really, all through the New Testament, even the Apostle Paul says, you know, the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. You know, because we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit makes intercession for us. The word he, he bridges the gap for our weaknesses. He knows there are areas where we have deficiencies and weaknesses. So he comes to help because he sees you. Your weaknesses don't put him off. As long as you connect by faith to that love relationship and just receive him, embrace him, put it in your mouth, there should be no time of prayer you have that you don't recognize and are grateful for the love of God for you. One of the greatest reasons why we give thanks is because we know he loves us. We know he cares for us. That's why we are thankful. That's why every New Testament prayer comes with thanksgiving. Prayer and supplication 
with thanksgiving. Let your request be why, we, why, why thanksgiving? Because we know he loves us. We know he has demonstrated his love. The Bible says God commended his love toward us, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us on the cross. We've already seen the demonstration of his love. We already saw a demonstration of his love. But the reality of that is that God brought his, his love near to us. That's really what that translation should be. He brought his love near to us. When his love is near, it means we can take hold of it. Any man, any woman can take hold of the love of God. And nothing can stop you. You can be born again anytime you choose to. If you activate the principles of salvation. If you confess Jesus as your Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, no demon in hell can stop you because God has brought his love close to you. So it's up to you to take hold of it, to grab it and take it for yourself. The same thing with all the blessings of the New Testament. He's brought his healing close to you. He's brought his peace close to you. He's brought salvation close to you. He's brought prosperity close to you. All of these are within access. And we can exercise faith towards those things. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Turn your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Hebrews chapter 4. Let's begin to read from verse 15. We have talked about the Holy Spirit and his helping our infirmities. Well, let's read verse 15 here. Verse 14. Let's start from 14. It says, seeing then, let's read it together. Let's start from 14. Thank you guys. Back. Let's read it together. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may do what? Obtain mercy. That's love. Come obtain mercy. Come obtain compassion. Come obtain his love. He has brought his love close to us. Come take it. Come receive it. It's your right. You are a child now. Amen. Come take it. Come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Hallelujah. Who needs grace this morning to help? Just receive it. Receive it. Take it in the name of Jesus. Lord, we receive your grace. We obtain mercy. We obtain mercy. We obtain mercy. We declare that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We declare that if God be for us, who can be against us. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world, in the economy. It doesn't matter what's going on with the systems, whether immigration or jobs or, or academics. If you are for us, you can get us over the, over the line. And we receive grace. We receive your love. We receive mercy for everything that we need to do in the name of Jesus, we receive the mercy of God to accomplish his plans and his purposes concerning our lives in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Finally, in Isaiah chapter, 50, chapter 53, I believe it's verse 4, the Bible says, He was wounded. For our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the punishment, the chastisement for our peace was laid on him. By his stripes, 
we are healed. By his stripes, we are healed. By his stripes, we are healed. Just say this to me. Say, Father, I know you see me. You know me inside out, yet you love me. I receive your love like I never received it before. I receive it afresh. And I thank you for your love for me in the name of Jesus. And I see you, Father. I see you. I see your love for me. I see the wounds on your body as you were nailed to the cross. I see those nail-pierced hands. I see the crown of thorns on your head. I see the bruises and the punishments and the curses and the shame that was dished out lavishly on you. And I see you loving me. I see you healing me. I see you setting me free from shame and timidity. I see you forgiving every sin, every mistake, every trespass I ever committed. I see you, Father. I see you. And I receive your love for me. In the name of Jesus, I declare that I am yours and you are mine. You are my portion in the land of the living. Say that with me. You are my portion in the land of the living. You are my inheritance. I am joint heirs with you. Everything that belongs to you belongs to me. Therefore, I come boldly to the throne of grace. I receive your mercy. I receive your love. I find grace today to help in the time of need. And I give you glory. I give you praise in the name of Jesus. Some of you, you need to get home and take bread and take wine just go before the Lord with the bread and the wine in communion and receive his love afresh receive his love bring any issue, any mounting, any challenge into focus as you do that and receive his love and thank him for his mercy, for his goodness over you in the name of Jesus I pronounce the healing power of God to flow through every sickness, every disease in the bodies of your people. And I command you sickness and disease to leave right now in the name of Jesus. Those bodies are temples of the living God. They were bought with a price. Jesus shed his blood to separate that body for himself and for his use. And those bodies are being strengthened. They are being made whole so they can serve the living God and do the things that are required by the Lord from them in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for manifesting yourself in diverse healings in this place this morning, even those of you who are live streaming, you're healed in the name of Jesus. You are healed in the name of Jesus. You are healed in the head. You are healed in your, in your, in your thorax, in your lungs, your heart, your kidneys. You are healed in the name of Jesus. You are healed in your joints, in your bones. In, your, in, your, in, the, in the sugar balance in your body, you are healed in the name of Jesus. Because the one who loved you went to the cross and paid the price for your healing. And he sees you today just as you see him. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet as we close. Let's declare together that surely
his goodness and his mercy follows us all the days of our lives as we dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah.